Uh, g'day, it's um, another good day with M365 me, and uh, I'm here along with one of the strands, Megan, in fact. Hi, Megan. Um, to deliver uh, going deep into direct routing with me, UC Mad Scientist. So uh, I hope everyone's getting ready, getting comfortable. We'll give a couple of minutes for everybody to get in, but in the meantime, we'll go over the bits and pieces uh, that no one really cares about. For example, who the hell am I? Um, I'm just a, a UC architect. I've been working in the Skype business realm and Microsoft Teams realm for a little while. Uh, was recently nominated as a MVP, same as Megan. I believe you got yours this year too. And um, uh, I've been working in the in the telephony space for mm, about fifteen years, but we'll get into that. Not not as much as you think. So um, yeah. Now um, we will just give another couple of minutes. But while we wait for that, we're going to quickly acknowledge um, the traditional owners of this land. So if you're not Australian or you're not from Australia or New Zealand, you might not know we're quite a young country uh, and we displaced the original owners of this land. And uh, we're just acknowledging that this land was originally theirs and we uh, acknowledge that they were the traditional custodian of the, of the land and that we're sharing it with them. And that, that's for the Australian based speakers as well as the New Zealand speakers. They have their own religious, uh, their own um, native uh, culture as well. So in, in saying that, we will pay respect to elders past, present and future. Now, as uh, part of any conference, this conference does have a code of conduct. The short version is we would expect you to be a respectful adult. Um, uh, we're not we're not tolerant of harassment, regardless of gender, gender identity, expression, sexual orientation, age, disability, appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, religion, or if you don't follow religion, doesn't, it should not affect you at all. Absolutely zero tolerance towards this and it will be instantly removed from the conference if that's the go. Um, again, sexual language imagery is not appropriate in, in public. Keep that stuff in your own time. Um, so uh, if you do need the long version or if you haven't read it already, you should have already had a look at it when you signed up. Check out the link that's on screen now um, and go from there. So with that, hopefully everyone's gotten their Outlook reminders and has hurriedly joined. If not, uh, we're going to talk about direct route for Teams. So um, this, this session might have scared a few people away in the fact that it talks something very deep about voice. And you don't need to be a voice expert to understand direct routing in Teams. Um, a normal understanding of IT in general uh, as, as IT pros are expected these days is expected. Um, so if you can administer Office 365, you can probably wrap your head around direct route. There are a couple of little gotchas and, and bits, and but as with most things, as long as you understand the jargon, you can do it. Um, half any field is understanding the jargon. So for example, myself, I started out as a Windows admin. I moved into, uh, I, I was going to become a data cabler running Cat5 through walls. I ended up picking up my Cisco certifications because I wanted to be a networking guy. Uh, from networking, I moved into firewalls and then I moved into unified comms. So there's no, you know, I, I haven't spent 10 years working on, on telephone frames uh, or, you know, 30 years like some people like Greg, uh, Greg and Sydney or, or some of the really seasoned voice people out there. You don't need to have a massive understanding of how voice works to get direct route running. So it's not really that scary at all. So what is direct route? So if you're not aware, Damien Margaritas gave a really good session on this uh, two weeks ago. It is available on the YouTube playlist. So if you, if some of this does stump you, go back and have a look at that session after this. There's plenty of info there. But for the very short uh, back of the napkin version is direct route is the ability to connect Microsoft Teams to your existing um, SIP telephony or, or telephony of any description via a certified SBC. And a certified SBC is literally just a piece of tin you put in your rack. It can be virtual if you like, and it just converts from Teams into whatever you want to speak to. Now, uh, in saying that, it is a standard voice platform um, and it uses a lot of the standard voice tools that we've used in PBXs from 
um, days gone by when we we're building asterisk boxes to Skype for Business to uh, now Teams. So we're, we're building on the SIT or the session initiation protocol. We're using real time protocol or RTP for our audio traffic and we use SBCs to route that traffic. So, um, and we'll touch on each of these in more detail as we get through the session. But we also have technologies that are Teams specific. Now other solutions may have very similar things, but Teams has their own implementation of them. And that is a voice routing policies, PSTN usages and voice routes. And they form part of your Teams configuration that allow your users to dial out using that direct route trunk functionality. All right, so we're going to break down SIP. Um, now, SIP is used in a lot of communications platforms. Um, as I said before, Asterisk, um, Switchbox, Digium, um, Skype for Business was primarily SIP based. Lots of um, voice telephony systems. Um, Cisco at one point used it, but now they use Skinny. Um, use it to communicate information between two endpoints. I mean, in this case, the two endpoints that we care about are two phones. We have a phone or a headset or a Teams client or whatever trying to call another phone. And the SIP uh, protocol is extremely versatile in the fact that I can put a name in there or I can put a um, phone number in there and whatever endpoint that I'm sending that to is expected to understand and route the call appropriately. So in this case, in the uh, on screen, we have uh, two phones. So if we have a look over here, and I'll just grab my laser pointer, we've got a phone. We have an example of what's called a SIP ladder. So this is the traffic that flows between the two endpoints. And then we have a, another phone. Now in the middle could be other PBXs, that could be switching infrastructure routers. They're completely irrelevant in this term. We're just, at this point, we are just worrying about the two phones and the communication that goes between them. So this ladder on screen probably looks really confusing because I haven't explained anything about it at all. And if you've seen SIP before, this will uh, um, this will all be common stuff. But we're just going to quickly break down what SIP does. SIP is a way for one phone to signal another phone that I want to do something. I want to call you. I want to transfer a call. I want to do something. It is a command and control mechanism. It is purely I want to do this and this is how I'm going to do it. All the sound that takes place or video, if you're doing video, is not part of SIP. It's an extension of SIP, but it's not in the SIP messaging. And we'll come into that later on. So, so let's say, for example, we've got uh, two ponies here and they're quickly trying to call each other using these phones. So a uh, phone on the left attempts to make a call to the phone on the right. So it does what's called a SIP invite. So it sends a specially formed SIP packet to the other device saying, hey, I'd like to call you. And in that SIP packet is a thing called an SDP or a session um, descriptor protocol, which is we'll get to that later, but that contains information about how I'm going to send you that call. Now, if the remote phone's there um, and everything's online and it's working, the first thing it'll do is it'll respond saying, yep, I'm trying uh, trying to resolve that for you. I've got your, your phone call. I'm just checking it to make sure it's all good. If the message that it's got is good, it matches the phone number of the phone that we're destined for, um, it's valid, uh, the SDP contains data for, that we support, everything's good, we'll send back the phone is ringing or 180 ringing in this case. And that's to let the original phone know the caller phone, a call, the called phone is ringing um, and that instructs the caller's phone to start playing a ringtone that we're all familiar with that noise when you after you dial a number so it's called ring back once that's occurred this is an optional step as part of SIP and the remote party will send a 183 session progress packet as a SIP in the SIP packet it does this to let uh, to start sending through its list of things that it supports uh, and how it wants to start communicating audio. Um, so again, it contains an SDP. That's something we'll come to a little bit later. Um, and it forwards it to the caller, callee's phone. Um, so containing that list. 
Now, if the call errs phone, so the person who started the phone call accepts the uh, the data that the, the remote phone has sent, so the, the codex match and all the data is match, it'll send through what's called a provisional act. Yes, I'm accepting what you've sent me. Um, I've opened the channel if we've sent through a 183 and media can play. Now, this doesn't mean that the phone call has been answered. It just means that audio is now going between the two. This is used before a phone call is answered to speed things up. It's done in the case of, um, of a phone call, maybe when you've called a number and you get the, the classic Telstra lady, your call has not been connected. That is sent using this 183 audio channel. So that audio channel has opened up and it's either playing a ringtone or it's playing a message or this call is being forwarded. Some sort of information is being given to the user through that audio channel, but the phone has not been answered. When the, phone, the user finally pulls the phone out of their pocket and finds, figures out how it works, the remote phone will send 200 OK. OK, I've answered that call. You can now establish the audio channel both ways. Um, so if we haven't sent a 183 previously, we'll send an SDP. Um, if we have, we won't send an SDP. Once that's occurred, the local phone or the person who made that phone call will then send an acknowledgement of that. OK, yep, cool. I got your SDP, audio channels open. I'm now going to um, use this data that we've both agreed on and we'll set up that audio. As you can see, the call will now take place uh, and we will send traffic from one side to the other in RTP. Um, so that's the sound data from that phone call. Now, I know I'm being a, a little bit jumpy ahead of, of concepts here. I will break down what the SDP and RTP are a little bit later in this session. Um, we're just trying to get an understanding of how that SIP signaling works to begin with. Once we're finished on the phone, you know, we've organized our play date or our meeting or whatever, I hang the phone up. And when I hang that phone up, uh, the phone sends a message to the remote phone or the, the one that didn't hang up saying, I hung up. It sends a buy packet. Now, as part of that, the remote phone is then expected to send back a OK again. Yes, I'm acknowledging your packet. That makes sense to me. Um, I'm now playing a busy tone or I've closed the window or I've done whatever the user expects when you hang up the phone. Um, so. And there's a lot there's a lot going on here, as you can see, there's a lot going on, on screen. This happens every time you make or break a phone call. Um, so there's a lot going backwards and forwards even before you set that phone call up. And that's why we we have these concepts of SIP ladders to diagnose. So with with all that massive amount of information I've just tried to stuff in your head, and, and, and I do apologize, we're trying to go over a lot in a very small time frame. What is in a SIP invite? The SIP invite that we've sent at the start of the call contains important information that we need to set that phone call up. It contains who the caller is and their PBX, who the callee is, or the um, uh, that should be called, um, the destination PBX, the called number or the number that I dialed to get um, that, I'm, that I'm calling, and the caller number, which is the number that I'm calling from, or my caller ID. And should also contain the SDP or the session description protocol. And we will get to that a little bit later. So you can see I've got an invite on screen. It's ridiculously small. So I'm just going to make it a bit bigger and break some of the formatting on this PowerPoint. Sorry, Megan. Um, and you can see I now have a very large uh, Wireshark trace on the screen. Now, for those who have done uh, Wireshark packet captures and stuff before, this may look a little bit familiar. This is a expanded view of a packet. Uh, and in that expanded view, we can see that we have a source and destination IP address that are listed for the, um, the traffic that, uh, that we've received on the wire. This is standard, typical, everyday IPv4 stuff. And as part of that, we also get Excuse me, I'm going to click on here. Um, what 
protocol we're using or what layer four protocol we're using, in this case, TCP instead of UDP. Uh, now I'd tell you all the joke about UDP, but you wouldn't get it. I'm sure you've all heard it, so I won't. Um, but in, in that, we've got the remote PBX that's sending us the calls IP address and the destinations PBX that we're sending the IP address. But this, this is just IPv4 stuff. What's specific about SIP? Well, as Wireshark breaks out for us, we have the session initiation protocol subsection, and it breaks out the invite. You can see in the request line, we have invite, SIP, the number we're calling. You can see that's present in a few places in the packet. The number we're calling from, you can see that's in the from header on the packet. We also have it in the contact header in the packet. That's not really relevant for um, direct route, but it is still there. We also have everywhere that's involved in the call in, uh, in different points in the packet. Now, this is important because in the voice world, you won't necessarily be talking to one server for your voice. The command and control data or the SIP data can be coming from one server and the audio can be coming from somewhere else. There may be multiple servers involved in the, in the SIP leg. So in this case, you can see the call has gone through a few servers. Realistically, for our purposes though, we only care about the two people that are in the from and the two address, or specifically the contact. So you'll see here, I've got the destination PBX after the destination phone number. So I'm calling this number at this PBX. So any SVC or routing appliance along the path can look at this packet and see, I need to send that to this IP address. And then if it gets to that IP address, that IP address needs to find that number. And again, we're using TCP for transport. This is uh, a little bit unique to Teams and Skype. Most other um, VoIP PABX systems use UDP as a method of transferring tra back, traffic back and forth. Because we're going over the internet, because we're going over less reliable links, TCP makes more sense, but it does have slightly more overhead and does increase call setup delay. Part of it is it allows us to encrypt the data, it allows us to secure it. So there, there are many reasons we do that. So we have the same packet here. We've just scrolled down a little bit. We now, as part of the same packet, we have the session description protocol. So you can see I still have the same number in the um, dialed number, and I still have the same destination IP address, the same source, but we now have the SDP. And the SDP is all this info down the bottom. And in that contains some important information. Inside the SDP, we'll see the connection information or the C line. And that is saying that it's an internet address, IPv4, and this IP address. This is where I'm sending my media or my sound once I start opening that sound channel. So you remember from before, we had that SIP ladder where we sent an SDP and I said, I'm going to make a call and you're going to send the sound to here. I'm saying send the sound to this IP address so I can process it. So it's important to understand that that's the media IP and it can be different from the signaling IP, which is this IP up here. So you might have a PBX that's processing the call and control data, but you might have an SBC next to it that's processing all the sound because it's converting it from one format to another or it's more efficient to use that box. It's very common. So it's very important to understand when you're setting your firewalls up, you follow the documentation on the Microsoft uh, docs website because it lists all those media IP addresses. As part of the SDP, we will also send through a codec list. So you'll see we have a bunch of media attributes or A lines uh, that specify we're turning silence suppression off, for example, and then we have RTP maps. Everything present in an RTP map is a codec. Codecs we're going to break down in the next little bit, but it is that's the sound, and that's how we're going to send the sound to the remote endpoint. So it's uh, the format of the sound that I'm sending. If, for example, I um, my PBX understands one set of codecs, 
I'm going to send through um, a list of those codecs as part of my SDP. The remote user is going to send through a list of codecs as part of their SDP. We're going to find one we agree on, and then we're going to try and use that. As part of the media description, we also have the codec preference order. So we can see we have the RTP, and in that we have a preference of zero and then 101. These numbers are purely to match up to this at media attribute further down. So you can see 0, 101 matches these two codecs here, 0 being PCMU, um, or more correctly, PCM mu, it's spelled MU, it's pronounced MU, mu. Um, it's a derivative of G711A, which is used in ISTN. We will cover this as part of the codec section. We also have the 101 telephone event codec. Um, it's really not as nice as it sounds. It's uh, DTMF tones. So you even know when you call the bank, you press the buttons to, to line, sign into internet banking. That's the way that we can send those sounds in the VoIP world. We don't send them as sound, we send them as messages. As part of that media IP, we need to send the media to a specific port or actually a port pair. So I'll be sending um, sending TCP media to 49861 in this case. The remote host specifies what they'll be doing. They also say that they'll be sending media from 49860. So that's a lot to take in, I, I know, and feel free that uh, if, if this is going too fast, ask a question. Um, I'm, I will take a few. I've got a couple of quizzes coming along as well. But also don't be afraid to grab this session afterwards and go back through it um, if you get stuck. There is also tons of information out there and we will we'll come to that a little bit more. This is just another view of that same SIP packet, or not, not the exact same packet, but a very similar SIP packet taken from another tool that's not Wireshark. Um, so for those that aren't aware, and I, I hope that most of the audience is aware, Wireshark is a packet capturing software that can grab um, internet packets off the off your network card as they come in so you can analyze them. This one is taken from the SBC uh, tool. In this case, it's a Sonus SBC. We're seeing a very similar SIP packet, um, but it's just been taken from the logs on the SBC instead of from the network interface. The same thing applies as with our previous capture. We have the source and destination PBXs that are using T TCP as a, a transmission protocol. We have the source, uh, sorry, the destination telephone number along with the destination IP address in the invite line. We have the caller ID and the source PBX in the from line. And the two lines still exists as well with the destination telephone number and the destination PBX. And we also have that SDP. Unlike when we're using Wireshark though, it's not nicely broken out to tell us what everything means. It's just assumed that you know what those values mean. So in the case, the C line is that connection line. That's that IP address I was talking about before where we're going to send that media. The M line is that codec priority list again. So again, zero and 101 with the codecs listed further down, zero being PCM mu and 101 being DTMF. But it's very similar to that packet before. It's just important to understand that this is where you'll get most of your data from because when you're using Teams direct routing, all the traffic is encrypted. So you won't be able to grab it off the wire from Wireshark like you can when you're diagnosing on your local PC because it's encrypted. You'll just see a mess. You'll need to use a tool like um, Sonus's LX or um, uh, Audio Code's uh, Syslog server that breaks this information out for you. The good thing about these sort of uh, tools is they give you the SIP ladder on the left. So you can remember before we were talking about the messages flying backwards and forwards between the two phones. Well, you can see over on the left here, I have that invite with all this data in it. And if I click through the each one of these, I'll get the relevant messages that are on screen. So in this case, uh, the remote PBX has tried to call me. I've sent back, I'm trying that number. I've opened the audio channel. They've acknowledged it. I've answered the call. Um, and then shortly after answering the call, I've played temporarily not available. Now, in this case, um, I've answered the call. 
because a, another PBX downstream answered and then tried to forward the call on. It couldn't forward the call on, so then it hung up. That's why I've sent back unavailable and the call has been torn down or hung up. So I know that was a lot to take in, but a bit of a quiz time before you get your QR code for loot. Which SDP message contains, which SIP message, sorry, contains the SDP? Is it A, trying, B, the prac message, C, ringing, or D, invite? Feel free to publish that in the um, Q&A. If you haven't um, used live events before, you can see there's a little, um, uh, little icon down the bottom to ask a question. If not, we'll move on. So the correct message, the correct answer there was trying. Uh, the trying or the um, no, it's not. It's the invite. I don't know why I put trying in there. The correct answer is invite. I have got the wrong thing selected in this. So the correct answer is D. And there's your QR code for those that are following along at home. Pull your phones out, give that a quick scan. Samsung phones, swipe down from the top and press QR. Uh, iPhones, you can just take a photo of it and apparently it recognises it. I don't know, I don't own one. So James, uh, sorry to interrupt, but we did get one response which was correct and it was invite. So I believe they got to invite before you did in that timing. Oh, I just wanted to point yep. that out. <laughs> that was Conrad. I'll publish that. Yeah, so I, I did goof up my slides. This is what happens when you, um, you run, make your slides on the uh, on the, the day of the event. So getting into it, back into it, Codex. The uh, as I said before, I've talked about this confusing thing, Codex. We know it's a, a, how sound is transmitted. What does it actually mean? A codec is a way of coding and decoding information sent, uh, audio information sent in a call. Hence, why it's called codec. It's an abbreviation is terrible, I know. Um, so, codecs, as I said, are a standard for transmitting sound over voice network. They define the sampling rate, which is how often we take a sample, and we'll get to that in a second. Bit depth, which is how much resolution we have in that sample. If we're using uh, any form of compression to try and make it smaller, or if we're passing multiple streams, or, um, so in the case of Meetings, we might use stereo sound. So we'll use two channels in that case. And we also have FEC. Not something I'm going to cover in this session, but if you do run into it, it's for forward error correction. Pardon me. And it means that the PBX has detected something's wrong with the internet link along the path and is using, is padding extra data in there to try and make up. So if there's some packet loss, uh, the remote PBX can make up that, that data. Um, interesting fact. In very special scenarios, teams can actually survive up to 50% packet loss um, of, if, if it's there's in short enough bursts. There's a really good demo of that, I believe, in Craig Schiffer's session on um, being a volunteer firefighter. Go check that one out as well. So what does a codec do? For those that don't know, and, and I'm sort of hoping that most people know how sound works, Sounds working by the fact that there's something in my throat that's vibrating as air's rushing past it. And that's making the air vibrate, and those vibrations turn into sound waves. They wobble the air, and that hits my eardrum, and my brain interprets that as sound. The problem is sound waves and vibrations are analog, and computers don't speak analog very well at all. So I've got a microphone hooked into my computer, and it's grabbing that data as analog data. It's got a wave that I'm receiving and that goes into my computer, but there's no way for me to transmit that without doing what's called an analog to digital conversion. And that's where we grab that information and sample it very regularly and try and make a best approximation of what that was. We can't replicate it one for one perfectly, but we can get pretty good. Um, so for example, um, CD sound quality sound to actually hear the difference, the, the resolution. Um, if, if like, you know, with an image, if you zoom in enough, you'll see the pixels. If you were to zoom in enough to hear the difference in CD sound, 
um, you go deaf. Uh, it can, it can, there's that many different levels of um, uh, resolution in there that it, it could send you deaf if one decibel was one bit. But anyway, moving on. So the codec will define how many bits we do. So we have our waveform that's going up and down and we'll use the resolution to sample how high or low that waveform gets. So with eight bits, we can have up to 256 different levels of loudness. Um, if we bump that up to 16 bit, we can then get 65,353, I think from memory, I could be wrong, um, different levels of loudness. So a massive jump from 256 to 6,000 odd, by just doubling the amount of bits. But the trade-off is we're doubling the amount of bits, which means we use twice as much data. In, in the voice world, it is very common to use 8-bit. It's also very common to use um, 11 kilohertz sampling. So sampling is how often we check the sound to see what level it's at. So as we come along, we can sample it, we sample where the points meet here and say, well, we assign this a number. This is three, we sample again. This is four, we sample again. This is five. Um, and the more samples we get, the more res resolution we have uh, for frequency. So if I, um, if, if I try and break this down a little bit more, when we have deep, low sounds, that frequency is long and stretched out. That's why um, deep low bass sounds come from big speakers and your high pitched tinny noises come from tweeters and they're very small speakers because they need to move very quickly. Whereas smaller speakers, uh, larger speakers can move more slowly because they're making the, the larger bassier notes. To effectively sample a uh, eight kilohertz sound, we need to sample at least twice as often as that sound. Or uh, um, so, if I uh, I'll get into the complexities of um, sound compression and dynamics, and that's, that's for a completely different session. But we need to sample more often than the frequency changes place. So, if I'm sampling at 11 kilohertz, there is no way I can replicate a 20 kilohertz sound. Um, it just gets lost. But we have the advantage of, um, because we're humans, we, we don't naturally make 20 kilohertz sounds when we're, um, when we're speaking. 20 kilohertz would be like a, a, a triangle dinging or something like that, and we don't make those sounds naturally in speech. So we don't need that extra data, because for every extra sample I do, I need another 16 or 8 bits of data. So if I bump my sampling rate to 22 kilohertz, which is, by the way, what we call HD sound in the voice industry, um, still only half of CD quality, by the way, um, then I would get twice as much sound uh, samples, which would make it sound better. The end shot of this is once I've passed this sound wave into the computer and I've done my analog to digital conversion, I will then plot those dots on a graph depending on how often I sample and how many bits that I have in my resolution. And I'll end up with something like that, which I will then send to the other end and it will reverse. It will take that those dots and approximately join them to get very close to what was originally sampled, but not quite. It won't be as smooth. It'll look chunky and yuck. And that's why whenever we digitize sound, unless we do it at a really high sampling rate, we can hear that difference. It doesn't sound like someone's right next to us. So that sort of stuff becomes important when we talk about the codex that we're using, because the codex define how often we sample and how many bits we use to sample. It defines how good the sound is. Now, typically, when you go higher up, they use more traffic or more bandwidth and more CPU resources. And as you go further down, with the exclusion of G729, they will use less traffic and less CPU resources. G729 will use less traffic, but more CPU resources because it's compressing it. And it sounds terrible and yuck. And if you use it, you're not my friend. It is a very old codec that we used back in the dial-up days, and some carriers still support it to this day, and it's terrible. Don't use it. So going back, we have Silk 
So Silk was a codec that was developed back in the Skype days before Microsoft bought them. Um, and when Microsoft came along, Microsoft grabbed everything that was about Silk uh, in the Skype implementation and released the open source version of it called Opus. Um, and that's been released for free. You can use it in whatever projects you like. It's completely royalty free. Silk stayed um, an in-house thing at Microsoft and they took what they learned from um, another codec they call real-time audio um, and added that into Silk and improved that uh, in saying that there's another codec coming very soon um, that uh, we're waiting for some more information about that'll be an improvement upon Silk. So Silk gave us that fantastic audio quality back in the dial-up days when we couldn't push data like G722. G722 is the next best codec um, in the fact that it's it's that HD voice that we were talking about because it uses a 22 kilohertz sample rate, it uses high bit rates. Um, it, you will see it incorrectly referenced as 8,000 hertz. It's not, it's purely kept there um, as a backwards compatibility thing. It is 22 kilohertz. Um, there are also extensions to G722, which um, your mobile phones use, for example. So whenever you make a call using your, your iPhone to another iPhone or an Android to another Android, and they sound amazingly crystal clear, they're using a codec called G722.2 AMR. Um, it's a derivative of this, and unfortunately, to today, Teams does not support it, but most SVCs will happily convert from AMR to 722 with a license, or even to Silk. <laughs> Your next codec down is G711, uh, and it's a very old school basic codec. It's actually derived from old ISDN services. Now, ISDN, for those who aren't aware, was our first widely deployed way of digitizing phone calls. Um, prior to ISDN, you had a physical pair that ran from your house that carried analog signals to an exchange and someone would, you know, or a machine would mechanically connect your two phones together. ISDN did away with that by converting it to digital and then sending packets um, over an ISDN network. Um, so you didn't need that dedicated wire to wire connection anymore. Um, but it was a very simple and basic uh, way of handling audio that only did it at about um, 11 kilohertz with an 8-bit resolution, so it's very poor. And then, as I mentioned before, G729 was something we had in the dial-up days. It was very popular with when VoIP became this massive thing because it could run down a dial-up phone line and not use much in the way of data. But it uses compression and it makes your voice sound terrible. And if you use it, you're horrible and you're not my friend, as I said before. Cool. Uh, we do have a question sitting there. In an avoid world, when a provider says they support HD voice, is that 16 bit? Um, the, to answer your question, Conrad, um, typically um, if you see it on a handset, um, like this one that has HD voice on it, it means they support G722. Um, but just like HD on televisions, it could mean a bunch of things. 720p, for example, is HD, whereas 1080p is full HD. Uh, it's a lot of marketing faff. You've really got to go into the specs to be able to, to answer that with any sort of um, any sort of good clarity. All right. So again, let's go for another question. Um, uh, spoiler alert, it is the same QR code, but um, we'll go for another question. Which codec was de developed by the Skype team? So G722, Silk, Opus, or Saturn? I'll give you a couple of seconds to put in your answers. I do forget that there is a delay, so excuse me while I just quickly grab a drink. I feel like we need a drum roll here, potentially. Get your questions I'm in. I'm guessing it's going to be Conrad that gets it. <laughs> Just leave that up for another second or two. Come on, Conrad, give it a crack. <laughs> it was actually a little bit of a trick question, um, in fact, as, oh, there we go, Conrad gets it with Silk. Um, it's actually a bit of a trick question because both Silk and Opus were developed by the original Skype team, um, but uh, Opus was the freeware version that's been released to the public and is now 
um, developed in the open domain, whereas Silk is now developed by Microsoft. But originally, Silk and Opus were the same, very similar codec. One was open source and one was not. So there's your QR code for those that are playing along. And Anonymous, I did see your answer. Thank you. Let me just give you a second to scan that QR code if you didn't grab it before. Otherwise, we're going to move on because I'm starting to get a bit dry on time. Um, cool. So what's a session border controller then? Uh, a session border controller is what connects our, our phone system or our phone carrier, whether it be MyNetPhone, Telstra, uh, Colored Lines, um, any, of, any of those sorts of carriers from the, their carrier world to our existing phone system, if we have one, uh, or to Office 365. Um, SBCs can also be used to handle analog devices, cordless devices, PA systems, gates, all that sort of stuff, because we can set routing rules up. So we have a call that starts over here in carrier land, and that call comes into our SBC, and our SBC will then apply routing logic to it, because it's just like a router. I mean, instead of routing packets, like they do, this routes phone calls. So in this case, it's gonna send the call to our legacy phone system because it saw that that call was for the legacy phone system or the user wasn't Teams enabled. Now, maybe in this case, it gets to the next SBC and, and you don't have to have two SBCs and um, it doesn't have to be Sonus and audio codes or ribbon and audio codes. There are other vendors that are certified as well. And I'm not saying that one vendor does one thing well or anything like that, it's just two images I had. Um, and maybe it gets to the second one, and this is a gateway, for example, and it's going to send the call to an old school analog phone, or maybe a PA system that I've got tied to uh, my factory floor or something. That's entirely possible using the SBC's routing. So we haven't touched Teams at this point. The call has come from the carrier. It goes into um, the SBC and it sends it to the appropriate analog device so that we, the Teams environment doesn't need to worry about it at all. Now, the reverse is also true. We can have teams call through these SBCs and instead of the call going out to the carrier, we can snatch that call before it gets there and send it to the analog device. We just give the analog device a phone number and teams will send it to it. So we might have another call example that comes in um, and it's coming from the carrier in a more traditional SIP, whether it's UDP traffic, it's not encrypted, uh, so then we convert it using our, our SBC to secure encrypted traffic and send that over the internet to Office 365. We can also send that over direct route if you're using direct route, but that's for a completely different piece. So what is the Teams specific stuff here? Well, in the Teams world, when a user picks up a phone and makes a phone call, they go through a very unique, uh, well, I wouldn't say unique process, but they go through a process similar to Skype did and similar to a lot of other PBXs do. The user picks up the phone and dials a number. Um, now, in this case, they're going to dial a full, uh, fully qualified number because we're lucky. We're not going to worry about normalization rules here. Um, and they dial, a, in this case, plus 1-800-642-7676. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's a fully normalized E164 number. Um, so you may see at the bottom of people's email signatures, they have you know, their number in a few different formats. They'll have, for example, my mobile will be 0432-500-648. But my E164 number or my globally unique phone number is plus, which means it's an E164 number, 61, which means I'm in Australia. I drop the zero because I'm not dialing out to another line. It's an Australian thing. 432 500-648. That is my E164 number. And you use normalization rules to fix that um, when a user dials a number to turn it into an E164 number. Once we've normalized the number, teams will then check to see if a voice routing policy exists. If a voice routing policy exists and it matches the number that I've dialed, it'll then start running through the PSDN usages for that voice routing policy. So the voice routing policy, uh, sorry, the voice routing policy is assigned to the user, not the number. The voice routing policy has PSTN usages in it. And in those PSTN usages, we have rules that say match this particular number, match this particular number. If So for example, my PSTN usages can say, this user is allowed to dial internationally, nationally, local calls only, or emergency numbers only. 
um, depending on which PSDN usages I have assigned to that policy. We do that by looking at the numbers that the users dialed. So for example, if I've got a user in Melbourne and I only let them dial locally, I would check whatever number they've dialed with. Dialed starts with plus 613 for Melbourne or plus 612 for Sydney. If they are allowed to dial nationally all over Australia, I just need to check if they were dialing plus 61. I wouldn't care what's after that because it's going to be a valid Australian number. Now, there are other services like you've got to be able to account for triple zero and one three numbers and one nine hundred numbers. There's a service that does all this for you, and we'll come to that in a minute. But the PSDN usages let me see if a user is allowed to dial a number. If they are allowed to dial a number and that it matches um, one of those PSDN usages, I'll then start trying SBCs I have associated to that PSTN usage. So for example, I might have two SBCs, one in Sydney and one in Melbourne, and because I'm trying to save costs, I'll have all calls that are destined for Melbourne to come out of the Melbourne SBC and all calls that are destined for Sydney to come out of the Sydney SBC. So that way, they only cost me a local call, even if the user's homed in Sydney or even potentially America. Little gotcha there. You do have to look out for countries like uh, India and there's other, a few others as well. They have a thing preventing toll bypass. You're not allowed to do that trick. Um, you have to pay your, your you know, fee for your long distance call, but again, not something we're going to cover here. If I then um, match a call route, so that's where I've figured out that it goes to the appropriate SBC, I will then send it to the SBC which the SBC will handle as we saw in that slide before by going through its translation tables and sending it to the carrier. It is important to note in this diagram that direct routing can coexist with a Microsoft calling plan if you're not in Australia or with Telstra calling for Office 365 if you are in Australia. So there's absolutely no reason you can't have both side by side. You can start a user on direct route uh, or start a business on direct route and then start migrating their numbers into Telstra Calling for Office 365. Or you can start a business on Telstra Calling for 365 and then use direct route to add extra functionality like a, an extra call center or a um, some analog devices or cordless phones or any of that sort of stuff. There is zero reason at all that these two can't exist together and don't let marketing tell you otherwise. I'll get my ass kicked for that. So as we said, a user will dial a number. It then goes through the voice routing policies. We'll then check the associated PSTN usages for that policy. Once we've checked those usages, the PSTN usages and we've found a relevant one, we'll go to a voice route. And in that voice route, we'll contain uh, the SBCs. We'll find the online PSTN gateway, which is the thing we set up in Office 365. And I'll show you some of that code shortly. The call then flows to the SBC. The SBC then runs through its translation table and then we send that to the carrier. Now I've talked about all these call flow rules and translation tables and voice policies and all this sort of stuff, and I haven't really explained what any of them are. Um, again, uh, I could spread this session over three days and not fit everything in, so I'm trying to cram as much in as I can now. Um, all these services use a, a way of matching numbers called regex. Um, which stands for regular, regular expression. It is a way of matching and manipulating strings. We can use text strings, we can use number strings, we can use whatever we like. In the voice world, we mainly manipulate numbers. Regex has a special syntax that is unique to it. There are plenty of tools online though that'll help you form valid regex queries. Um, in fact, while I'm quickly going to go through these regex things now, I don't actually expect you to learn them from this session. Um, even on the old Skype exam, when Microsoft was doing that Skype exam, they had regex questions, but they never actually expected you to make your own regex string, just read someone else's. Regex is a, a, a string of characters that we use to match another string of characters. Um, and at the start of any regex string, we'll have a caret. Anyone that's not aware, this little up arrow is called a caret, um, and it's not spelt like the one that you eat either. Um, and that denotes this is the start of the string that we're trying to match. 
Now, when we're working with regex, you don't have to have a carrot and a dollar sign. You don't need to specify the start and finish of a, your match. But if you build a regex string, for example, that matches triple zero and then flags that call as an emergency call and sends it direct to triple zero, you would definitely need to use that carrot and dollar sign. Otherwise, if someone calls 0398361000, that will instantly flag as an emergency call and go to your emergency call provider. Not a good thing. So it's good practice to have that start and finish so we know we're only matching exactly what we want. But the next important character is a period or full stop or, or um, point, depending on, on however you prefer to pronounce it. And it just means match anything once. Uh, in dialing plans, we use it to match a single digit purely because it looks good instead of using slash D. Um, so if I want to match three digits, it's quite common to go dot, dot, dot um, instead of slash D, slash D, slash D. It makes it so much easier to read. Slash D, however, is used in, digit, in, in regex a fair bit, and it means match a digit. Now, it is important that it is a lowercase D. Lowercase D means match a digit. Uppercase D means match anything that's not a digit. So it is case sensitive. Uh, and then I can specify afterwards how many digits I want to match. We'll get to that in the next page. Inside square braces, I can say match one character between zero and something, or one and something, or you know, in this case, zero and seven. Or I can say match between one and two, or um, I can also specify with commas multiple, so match one, three, and five. So this is a way of, of selecting things that are valid in that character spot. Pipe is used as an OR operator, so match this OR that. So I could have match 000, pipe, OR, 123. So if a dial user dials triple zero, it'll match. If they dial 123, it'll match. Um, not a good idea to stick them together in the same rule because you want to apply different translations, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Backslash is a special character in regex, and it means whatever the next character is that has special connotations, ignore those special connotations, match it literally. So for example, plus in regex means something special. Dollar sign means something special. If I put a slash before it, it ignores that something special, um, which is very important for us in the voice world because we use plus a lot. So you'll see backslash plus in a lot of dial plans. And in this case, I can also match the number one, the number one, two, three. A little bit more of matching numbers. So on the previous slide, we had things that we matched. Now we're saying how often we're going to match them. So in the case of that slash D, I might put it in curly brace, uh, put curly braces after it and say nine, which means match nine digits. Or I could put curly braces and say five to 10 which means match between five and 10 digits. So if a number is uh, a certain length and then I add um, uh, uh, too many digits on the end, it won't match. You'll see this used a lot in dial plans and that's asterisks and it's good and bad. Asterisk means match anything, whether it be once, a million times, twice, or even no times. So it's good, you gotta be very careful with um, dollar signs and using it, because if, if you've got dollar, dot dollar sign, everything will go through. So just be careful when you use it. Try and use question mark instead. Question mark will match zero or once, but it won't match a million times. So um, if you need to catch whether they've got the plus sign or not, you could put slash plus, slash plus question mark, and that would match if the plus was there or not. And then lastly, in the capture, in the matching section, we have capture groups. So anything I stick inside a uh, pair of brackets is a capture group, and that will um, be kept for use later in our translation pattern. In our translation pattern, we don't use much in Teams, um, really, that we need to stress too much about. Um, there's a lot of stuff we can do in there, but there's tools and there's predefined dial plans available from people online already who've already done this for you, so you don't need to do it yourself. But it's important that you understand dollar $1 or slash $1 means the first pair of brackets, dollar $2 or slash $2 means whatever isn't I caught in the second pair of brackets. Another quick question, uh, and I'm going to have to hurry up because we're starting to get a bit close on time. Which regex would I use to match an Australian number? 
So all Australian numbers start with 6-1 and then have, uh, or plus 6-1 correctly, and then have nine digits after that. Which would be the correct way to match that? A, B, C, or D, they all look very similar and they all do similar sorts of things, but which would be the correct way of doing that? Mm. I might I might run over a little bit, guys. I do apologize. Um, or everyone, I do apologize. Um, if you need to drop off, feel free to drop off. Um, uh, is it all right if I run a little bit over, um, Megan? Yeah, Megan? totally fine. Fine with me. Totally. Totally sorry about that. OK, moving on, the correct answer there was A, and we'll break down why that was in the next slide very quickly. I understand that uh, not everybody is really interested in how that works because, as I said, there are tools that do it for you. In fact, I'll show you some. So the first one, we start the string, we match plus 6-1 exactly, so we have that slash that says match the plus. Ooh, option C. We'll come to that, Conrad, in a second. Um, so we have plus six one slash d nine end of string. So we're going to match plus six one, then nine digits. We won't match if there's more or less digits. B, which was start a string plus six one slash d nine dollar sign, looks very similar, but unfortunately we're missing the slash on the plus. And this is actually invalid syntax. If you put this into any decent regex tool, it will tell you it's invalid because we're trying to match one or more of carrot, which is impossible. So this, this wouldn't work. Um, plus six one slash D nine in square braces. We're going to match plus six one, then any, any digit. And then I'm going to match the number nine explicitly. That's not going to work. Um, and then the last one we have is uh, carrot slash plus one, six one star. We're basically going to try and match plus six, and then we're going to try and match one as many times as we possibly can. Um, so maybe this would work if you could dial a number six one 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 one, um, but it wouldn't. It's not, it's actually not valid syntax. It wouldn't work either. Over on the right hand side, you'll see I've got a QR code for regex101.com. Uh, if you ever need help understanding a bit of regex that you've got, or um, a dial string that you've got, or you're troubleshooting a dial string, punch that regex into that website. And over on the right hand side, it will show you exactly what it's doing and what steps it's going through. It, because uh, I, I use it to this day. I use it to write this guide. Um, I, I, Regex is a wonderful and evil beast. Cool. So, so now that we understand, um, uh, now that we understand how Regex and everything plays in and how um, Teams um, routes calls from the online Office 365 platform to our SBC, let's go about setting it up. Now, this, um, this code I understand is probably going to be a little bit small and might be a bit hard to read in the online session. I'm not actually expecting you to read this. Um, Damien Margaritas, who's another presenter here at M365 May, did a, a really good session on direct route. He has all of this documentation on his website. Um, I'll be brutally honest, I still refer to it to this day when I, I need to set one up. But the first thing we'll do is we'll set up our new CS Online gateway, and that's just our PST, uh, SBC appliance that we've got sitting in our rack. It's sitting in the rack, it's connected to the internet. We need to tell Office 365 about it. So we do that with this piece of code. We then create a PSTN online usage. So in this case, I'm going to create an online usage, call it Australia. And inside that usage, I'm going to add um, a bunch of voice routes. So we were talking about how we have a PSTN usage and it's um, it's in voice policies. Um, the, the PSTN usages are inside the policies and we have voice routes inside those PSTN usages. So we create those voice routes inside the PSTN usage. In this case, I match exactly triple zero. I match six one, start with one, two to eight digits. So this will do things like one three hundred numbers, one three double one double six. Um, pizza Hut delivery, anyone? Um, the national numbers that I was talking about before. And then this really complex one for international, which basically says uh, match anything except for six one or one. This is not well for six one one nine. So I won't premium numbers won't match. Um, then any length of digits 
and we send them to the appropriate SVC. So you can see we're sending these to my SVC as part of my tenant. And then we create a new online voice routing policy which uses those uh, PSTN usages that we did before. As I said, Damien documents this really well, but you don't need to understand any of this because you can just go to Ken Lasko, uh, fellow MVP Ken Lasko's website, ucdialplans.com. Tell it where you are or where your SVC is located and what your user is going to dial, and it will spit out the PowerShell for you. It, it takes all that nasty complexity and stuff that I was just talking about that was ridiculously complicated and distills it down into a small PowerShell script. You, you feed it some info, you can see I'm using Microsoft Teams, I'm in Australia and I'm connecting to a SIP trunk, bang, it connects it all for me. I just tell it that I'm in this case, I'm in Sydney and all the, all the rules are created. Um, now, Ken does put a lot of effort into this. He does so many countries. I think it's, it's in the hundreds now um, of countries that he has dial plans for. He does it all for free, chip him a couple of bucks. Um, the, the service costs him some money to run. So um, I, I make sure every time I use it, I flick him a couple of bob on PayPal. Uh, same sort of thing that we saw on Damien's blog. We have to set the user up um, to use these policies that we've done. So we can go and set our user, in this case me, um, and we enable them for enterprise voice. Uh, we set them up for voicemail and we give them a telephone number. This telephone number is obviously fake. Um, if I then go get that user, you can see that they have a um, telephone number associated and they will also have a voice routing policy, which I've not assigned. I forgot to do in the screenshot. But I would assign that Australia voice routing policy. But again, um, assigning policies or manipulating policies is not something that you need to, to stress or it has to be complicated. Um, another MVP from Melbourne, uh, Australia, and another one that starts with James, James Cusson writes two fantastic tools for manipulating your direct routing routes and your policies and assigning routes, uh, assigning policies to those users in the direct routing tool over here. So you can see the direct routing tool allows me to pick a user and what policies they have. I can then set routes for those policies and what SBCs they hit. And I can even test my number normalization routes and what that's going to hit all before I'd make changes and push that into the cloud. So really good tool to use. It's a QR code that will take you straight to that page. Go download it, have a look. Um, he also has his tenant dial plan tool, which is um, does your translations. So we talked about normally before, I will dial uh, a mobile number, for example, I pick up my mobile and I dial 10 digits, 0432-500-648. The dial plan will then convert that into the normalized number, plus 61, 432-500-648. Um, Ken Lasko's tool will create all that stuff for you. James's tool will let you manage it. Um, so it's well worth looking at, and there's a QR code there for that as well. All right, I do apologize. We're a couple of minutes over, so um, I will just do a quick shout out to our sponsors. Um, now, like all things online, we've got a quick, a quick shout out to Raid Shadow Legends. Not really. Our real sponsors are Regarding365. Thanks to the Regarding365 team, the Strands, and, uh, and everyone involved for putting this course together. Swoop, Averpoint, Valo all make uh, great Office 365 stuff. Logitech and Poly for Teams endpoints, some of which I'm using today. Exclaimer make tools that let you um, put signatures on the bottom of your emails and do that all um, uh, universally. One place is not something I've come across before, but they are a sponsor and you should probably go check them out anyway. Live tiles I actually met up with um, a couple of years ago at Ignite. They are really good blokes and they have a ton of SharePoint stuff. Uh, and now Powell and Kudos all as well have 365 stack software that's well worth looking at. Uh, and Microsoft for one running creating these products that we use and, and allowing us to work from home in, the, in this COVID pandemic and, um, and and also helping us with this event by sponsoring the whole thing and doing it through um, uh, Teams Live events. Uh, and Plenum, um, if you're not aware, these are handy if you've got kids sitting at home, they make these little things. So um, you're, these can change color depending on your, your status. So well worth looking into. And that's it for me. So if you've got any questions or, or anything, um, stick them in the q and I'll hang around for a couple of minutes. Uh, but other than that, I, I hope you've really enjoyed uh, M365 May. It, it sounds like it's been really good. This is my last session. 
Um, I think today's the last day too, isn't it, Megan? Um, I, I think I'll be one of the last sessions now, actually, come to think of it. Um, really? Yeah. No, I, no, it goes to no. the 29th. Oh, okay, cool. See, here I am just being big headed. Maybe I've got more sessions that I need to go look at. Any so, questions? Uh, M365 May runs for the month of May, James, and yes, we yes. have sessions all through <laughs> next week. We finish up next Friday at uh, two right. o'clock. And it's actually, I'm on the last day, James. Um, You're on so, the last day. <laughs> so a user adoption session, I take it? So on the last day, we actually have a really great variety of adoption sessions. I'll stop being rude and put my video on um, so I can be more social. Mm. Um, yeah, so we've got a couple of panels. We've got a great panel on um, tough conversations and leadership during a crisis, and we've got a panel for that. Um, and we also have our exciting lock note, which is Jeff Teeper from Microsoft in Seattle is uh, joining in for a session to be interviewed. So if you That's think right. week. Yes, now, I, I did know about that, and I don't know why I thought this was, I was this is the last week. I um, Do you have a session on awkward conversations with smart ass nerds? <laughs> no, but let's book one in. Um, right. And yeah, how to make things all about yourself. Oh, that's not me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go find a corner and hide. So um, yeah, I, I hope everybody enjoyed that. If you've got any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, my blog is ucmadscientist.com. Uh, all the, I'll be keeping an eye on the 365 um, May uh socials as well as the this meeting as well so if you've got any questions ask away otherwise um i think that's it from us thanks so much james that was really interesting even for me who's a non-tech i learn a few things so thanks appreciate it awesome all right thanks everybody